The ghoul that was Pikmin now went below and gave the night gaunts their simple instructions, while the ship drew very near to the ominous and malodorous wharves. Presently a fresh stir rose along the waterfront, and Carter saw that the motions of the galley had begun to excite suspicion. Evidently, the steersman was not making for the right dock, and probably the watchers had noticed the difference between the hideous ghouls and the almost human slaves whose places they were taking. Some silent alarm must have been given, for almost at once a horde of the mephitic moon-beasts began to pour from the little black doorways of the windowless houses, and down the winding road at the right. A rain of curious javelins struck the galley as the prow hit the wharf, felling two ghouls and slightly wounding another. But at this point all the hatches were thrown open to emit a black cloud of whirring night gaunts, which swarmed over the town like a flock of horned and cyclopean bats. The jellyish moon-beasts had procured a great pole and were trying to push off the invading ship, but when the night gaunts struck them they thought of such things no more. It was a very terrible spectacle to see those faceless and rubbery ticklers at their pastime, and was tremendously impressive to watch the dense cloud of them spreading through the town and up the winding roadway to the reaches above. Sometimes a group of the black flutterers would drop a toad-like prisoner from aloft by mistake, and the manner in which the victim would burst was highly offensive to the sight and smell. When the last of the night gaunts had left the galley, the ghoulish leaders glibbered in order of withdrawal, and the rowers pulled quietly out of the harbor between the gray headlands, while still the town was a chaos of battle and conquest. The Pikmin ghoul allowed several hours for the night gaunts to make up their rudimentary minds, and overcome their fear of flying over the sea, and kept the galley standing about a mile off the jagged rock while he waited and dressed the wounds of the injured men. Night fell, and the gray twilight gave place to the sickly phosphorescence of low clouds, and all the while the leaders watched the high peaks of that accursed rock for signs of the night gaunt's flight. Toward morning, a black speck was seen hovering timidly over the topmost pinnacle, and shortly afterward the speck had become a swarm. Just before daybreak, the swarm seemed to scatter, and within a quarter of an hour it had vanished wholly in the distance toward the northeast. Once or twice something seemed to fall from the thinning swarm into the sea, but Carter did not worry, since he knew from observation that the toad-like moon-beasts cannot swim. At length, when the ghouls were satisfied that all the night gaunts had left for Sarcomond and the great abyss with their doomed burdens, the galley put back into the harbor betwixt the gray headlands, and all the hideous company landed and roamed curiously over the denuded rock with its towers and eyries and fortresses, chiseled from the solid stone. Frightful were the secrets uncovered in those evil and windowless crypts, for the remnants of unfinished pastimes were many, and in various stages of departure from their primal state. Carter put out of the way certain things which were, after a fashion, alive, and fled precipitately from a few other things about which he could not be very positive. The stench-filled houses were furnished mostly with grotesque stools and benches, carven from moon trees, and were painted inside with nameless and frantic designs. Countless weapons, implements, and ornaments lay about, including some large idols of solid ruby depicting singular beings not found on earth. These latter did not, despite their material, invite either appropriation or long inspection, and Carter took the trouble to hammer five of them into very small pieces. The scattered spears and javelins he collected, and with Pikmin's approval, distributed among the ghouls. Such devices were new to the dog-like lopers, but their relative simplicity made them easy to master after a few concise hints. The upper part of the rock held more temples than private homes, and in numerous hewn chambers were found terrible carven altars and doubtfully stained fonts and shrines for the worship of things more monstrous than the mild gods atop Kadath. From the rear of one great temple stretched a low black passage, which Carter followed far into the rock with a torch, till he came to a lightless domed hall of vast proportions, whose vaultings were covered with demonic carvings, 
and in whose center yawned a foul and bottomless well, like that in the hideous monastery of Lang, where broods alone the high priest not to be described. On the distant shadowy side, beyond the noisome well, he thought he discerned a small door of strangely wrought bronze, but for some reason he felt an unaccountable dread of opening it, or even approaching it, and hastened back through the cavern to his unlovely allies as they shambled about with an ease and abandon he could scarcely feel. The ghouls had observed the unfinished pastimes of the moon beasts and had profited in their fashion. They had also found a hogshead of potent moon wine and were rolling it down to the wharves for removal and later use in diplomatic dealings, though the rescued trio, remembering its effect on them in Dilithleen, had warned their company to taste none of it. Of rubies from lunar mines there were a great store, both rough and polished, in one of the vaults near the water, but when the ghouls found they were not good to eat, they lost all interest in them. Carter did not try to carry any away, since he knew too much about those which had mined them. Suddenly there came an excited meeping from the sentries on the wharves, and all the loathsome foragers turned from their tasks to stare seaward and cluster round the waterfront. Betwixt the grey headlands a fresh black galley was rapidly advancing, and it could be but a moment before the almost humans on deck would perceive the invasion of the town and give the alarm to the monstrous things below. Fortunately, the ghouls still bore the spears and javelins which Carter had distributed amongst them, and at his command, sustained by the being that was Pikmin, they now formed a line of battle and prepared to prevent the landing of the ship. Presently, a burst of excitement on the galley told of the crew's discovery of the changed state of things, and the instant stoppage of the vessel proved that the superior numbers of the ghouls had been noted and taken into account. After a moment of hesitation, the newcomers silently turned and passed out between the headlands again, but not for an instant did the ghouls imagine that the conflict was averted. Either the dark ship would seek reinforcements, or the crew would try to land elsewhere on the island. Hence a party of scouts was at once sent up toward the pinnacle to see what the enemy's course would be. In a very few minutes, a ghoul returned breathless to say that the moon beasts and almost humans were landing on the outside of the more easterly of the rugged grey headlands, and ascending by hidden paths and ledges which a goat could scarcely tread in safety. Almost immediately afterward, the galley was sighted again through the flume-like strait, but only for a second. Then a few moments later, a second messenger panted down from aloft to say that another party was landing on the other headland both being much more numerous than the size of the galley would seem to allow for. The ship itself, moving slowly with only one sparsely manned tier of oars, soon hove in sight betwixt the cliffs and lay to in the fetid harbor as if to watch the coming fray and stand by for any possible use. By this time, Carter and Pickman had divided the ghouls into three parties, one to meet each of the two invading columns and one to remain in the town. The first two at once scrambled up the rocks in their respective directions, while the third was subdivided into a land party and a sea party. The sea party, commanded by Carter, boarded the anchored galley and rowed out to meet the undermanned galley of the newcomers, whereat the latter retreated through the strait to the open sea. Carter did not at once pursue it, for he knew he might be needed more acutely near the town. Meanwhile, the frightful detachments of the moon beasts and almost humans had lumbered up to the top of the headlands and were shockingly silhouetted on either side of the grey twilight sky. The thin hellish flutes of the invaders had now begun to whine, and the general effect of those hybrid half-amorphous processions was as nauseating as the actual odour given off by the toad-like lunar blasphemies. Then the two parties of the ghouls swarmed into sight and joined the silhouetted panorama. Javelins began to fly from both sides, and the swelling meeps of the ghouls and the bestial howls of the almost humans gradually joined the hellish whine of the flutes to form a frantic and indescribable chaos of demon cacophony. Now and then, bodies fell from the narrow ridges of the headlands into the sea outside or the harbor inside in the latter case being sucked quickly under by certain submarine lurkers whose presence was indicated only 
by prodigious bubbles. For half an hour this dual battle raged in the sky, till upon the west cliff the invaders were completely annihilated. On the east cliff, however, where the leader of the Moon Beast party appeared to be present, the ghouls had not fared so well, and were slowly retreating to the slopes of the pinnacle proper. Pickman had quickly ordered reinforcements for this front from the party in the town, and these had helped greatly in the earlier stages of the combat. Then, when the western battle was over, the victorious survivors hastened across to the aid of their hard-pressed fellows, turning the tide and forcing the invaders back again along the narrow ridge of the headland. The almost humans were by this time all slain, but the last of the toad-like horrors fought desperately with the great spears clutched in their powerful and disgusting paws. The time for javelins was now nearly past, and the fight became a hand-to-hand -hand contest of what few spearmen could meet upon that narrow ridge. As fury and recklessness increased, the number falling into the sea became very great. Those striking the harbor met nameless extinction from the unseen bubblers, but of those striking the open sea, some were able to swim to the foot of the cliffs and land on tidal rocks, while the hovering galley of the enemy rescued several moon beasts. The cliffs were unscalable except where the monsters had debarked, so that none of the ghouls on the rocks could rejoin their battle line. Some were killed by javelins from the hostile galley or from the moon beasts above, but a few survived to be rescued. When the security of the land parties seemed assured, Carter's galley sallied forth between the headlands and drove the hostile ship far out to sea, pausing to rescue such ghouls as were on the rocks or still swimming in the ocean. Several moon beasts washed on rocks or reefs were speedily put out of the way. Finally, the moon beast's galley being safely in the distance and the invading land army concentrated in one place, Carter landed a considerable force on the eastern headland in the enemy's rear after which the fight was short-lived indeed. Attacked from both sides, the noisome flounderers were rapidly cut to pieces or pushed into the sea, till by evening the ghoulish chiefs agreed that the island was again clear of them. The hostile galley, meanwhile, had disappeared, and it was decided that the evil jagged rock had better be evacuated before any overwhelming horde of lunar horrors might be assembled and brought against the victors. So by night, Pickman and Carter assembled all the ghouls and counted them with care, finding that over a fourth had been lost in the day's battles. The wounded were placed on bunks in the galley, for Pickman always discouraged the old ghoulish custom of killing and eating one's own wounded, and the able-bodied troops were assigned to the oars or to such other places as they might most usefully fill. Under the low phosphorescent clouds of night, the galley sailed and Carter was not sorry to be departing from that island of unwholesome secrets, whose lightless domed hall with its bottomless well and repellent bronze door lingered restlessly in his fancy. Dawn found the ship in sight of Sarcomon's ruined keys of basalt, where a few night-gaunt sentries still waited, squatting like black horned gargoyles on the broken columns and crumbling sphinxes of that fearful city, which lived and died before the years of man. The ghouls made camp amongst the fallen stones of Sarcomond, dispatching a messenger for enough night gaunts to serve them as steeds. Pickman and the other chiefs were effusive in their gratitude for the aid Carter had lent them, and Carter now began to feel that his plans were indeed maturing well, and that he would be able to command the help of these fearsome allies, not only in quitting this part of Dreamland, but in pursuing his ultimate quest for the gods atop unknown Kadath and the marvelous sunset city they so strangely withheld from his slumbers. Accordingly, he spoke of these things to the ghoulish leaders, telling what he knew of the cold waste wherein Kadath stands, and of the monstrous Shantaks and the mountains carven into double-headed images which guard it. He spoke of the fear of Shantaks for night gaunts, and of how the vast hippocephalac birds fly screaming from the black burrows high up on the gaunt gray peaks that divide Inginok, from hateful Lang. He spoke, too, of the things he had learnt concerning night gaunts from the frescoes in the windowless monastery of the high priest not to be described, how even the great ones fear them, 
and how the ruler is not the crawling chaos Nyarlathotep at all, but hoary and immemorial Nodens, lord of the great abyss. All these things Carter glibbered to the assembled ghouls, and presently outlined that request which he had in mind, and which he did not think extravagant considering the services he had so lately rendered the rubbery dog-like lopers. He wished very much, he said, for the services of enough night gaunts to bear him safely through the air past the realm of Shantox and Carven Mountains, and up into the cold waste beyond the returning tracks of any other mortal. He desired to fly to the Onyx Castle atop unknown Kadath in the cold waste, to plead with the Great Ones for the Sunset City they denied him, and felt sure that the night gaunts could take him thither without trouble, high above the perils of the plain and over the hideous double heads of those carven sentinel mountains that squat eternally in the grey dusk. For the horned and faceless creatures there could be no danger from aught of earth, since the great ones themselves dread them. And even were unexpected things to come from the other gods, who are prone to oversee the affairs of earth's milder gods, the night gaunts need not fear, for the outer hells are indifferent matters to such silent and slippery flyers as own not Nyarlhotep for their master, but bow only to potent and archaic nodens. A flock of ten or fifteen night gaunts, Carter glibbered, would surely be enough to keep any combination of Shantox at a distance, though perhaps it might be well to have some ghouls in the party to manage the creatures, their ways being better known to their ghoulish allies than to men. The party could land him at some convenient point within whatever walls that fabulous onyx citadel might have, waiting in the shadows for his return or his signal whilst he ventured inside the castle to give prayer to the gods of earth. If any ghouls chose to escort him into the throne room of the Great Ones, he would be thankful, for their presence would add weight and importance to his plea. He would not, however, insist upon this, but merely wished transportation to and from the castle atop unknown Kadath, the final journey being either to the marvelous sunset city itself, in case the gods proved favorable, or back to the earthward gate of deeper slumber in the enchanted wood in case his prayers were fruitless. Whilst Carter was speaking, all the ghouls listened with great attention, and as the moments advanced, the sky became black with clouds of those night gaunts for which messengers had been sent. The winged horrors settled in a semicircle around the ghoulish army, waiting respectfully as the dog-like chieftains considered the wish of the earthly traveler. The ghoul that was Pikmin glibbered gravely with its fellows, and in the end Carter was offered far more than he had at most expected. As he had aided the ghouls in their conquest of the moon beasts, so would they aid him in his daring voyage to the realms whence none had ever returned, lending him not merely a few of their allied night gaunts, but their entire army as they encamped, veteran fighting ghouls and newly assembled night gaunts alike, save only a small garrison for the captured black galley, and such spoils as had come from the jagged rock in the sea. They would set out through the air whenever he might wish, and once arrived on Kadath, a suitable train of ghouls would attend him in state as he placed his petition before Earth's gods in their onyx castle. Moved by a gratitude and satisfaction beyond words, Carter made plans with his ghoulish leaders for his audacious voyage. The army would fly high, they decided, over hideous Lang with its nameless monastery and wicked stone villages stopping only at the vast grey peaks to confer with the Shantok frightening night gaunts whose burrows honeycombed their summits. They would then, according to what advice they might receive from those denizens, choose their final course, approaching unknown Kadath either through the desert of Carven Mountains north of Inganok, or through the more northerly reaches of repulsive Lang itself. Dog-like and soulless as they are, the ghouls and night gaunts had no dread of what those untrodden deserts might reveal, nor did they feel any deterring awe at the thought of Kadath towering lone with its onyx castle of mystery. About midday, the ghouls and night gaunts prepared for flight, each ghoul selecting a suitable pair of horned steeds to bear him. Carter was placed well up toward the head of the column beside Pikmin, and in front of the hole a double line of riderless night gaunts was provided as a vanguard. At a brisk meep from Pikmin, 
the whole shocking army rose in a nightmare cloud above the broken columns and crumbling sphinxes of primordial sarcomond, higher and higher till even the great basalt cliff behind the town was cleared, and the cold, sterile tableland of Lang's outskirts laid open to sight. Still higher flew the black host, till even this tableland grew small beneath them, and as they worked northward over the windswept plateau of horror, Carter saw once again with a shudder the circle of crude monoliths, and the squat, windowless building which he knew held that frightful silken-mast blasphemy from whose clutches he had so narrowly escaped. This time no descent was made as the army swept bat-like over the sterile landscape passing the feeble fires of the unwholesome stone villages at a great altitude, and pausing not at all to mark the morbid twistings of the hooved, horned, almost humans that dance and pipe eternally therein. Once they saw a Shantok bird flying low over the plain, but when it saw them, it screamed noxiously and flapped off to the north in grotesque panic. At dusk, they reached the jagged gray peaks that form the barrier of Ingenok, and hovered about those strange caves near the summits which Carter recalled as so frightful to the Shantoks. At the insistent meeping of the ghoulish leaders, there issued forth from each lofty burrow a stream of horned black flyers, with which the ghouls and night gaunts of the party conferred at length by means of ugly gestures. It soon became clear that the best course would be that over the cold waste north of Ingenok. For Lang's northward reaches are full of unseen pitfalls that even the night gaunts dislike. Abysmal influences centering in certain white hemispherical buildings on curious knolls, which common folklore associates unpleasantly with the other gods and their crawling chaos, Nyarl Hotep. Of Kadath, the flutterers of the peaks knew almost nothing save that there must be some mighty marvel toward the north, over which the Shantoks and the Carven Mountains stand guard. They hinted at rumored abnormalities of proportion in those trackless leagues beyond, and recalled vague whispers of a realm where night broods eternally. But of definite data they had nothing to give, so Carter and his party thanked them kindly, and crossing the topmost granite pinnacles to the skies of Ingenok, dropped below the level of the phosphorescent night clouds, and beheld in the distance those terrible squatting gargoyles that were mountains till some titan hand carved fright into their virgin rock.